Hey everybody, welcome to Purpose People. Today we have an international rugby star from Wales, also a coach, and uh, we're delighted to have him on the sofa. It's Darren Edwards, so lovely to have you on board with us today. today. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. So Darren, we've, we've met we've through networking and stuff like that, and I heard a little bit about your journey and, and, and sort of like you making the transition from a player to a coach and helping people essentially live out their purpose through sport and elite sports. And then also trying to apply that into business as well. So, so it was a must to get you on. So thank you so much for coming. Um, so let's start at the beginning, I guess. When did you think that playing rugby, that you could do something with it? Yeah, it came as a surprise, actually, because I had gone to university. Um, rugby wasn't a career, career. And then all of a sudden, the game turned professional. So... One minute I was going to be a history teacher, the next thing I'm going to be a professional rugby player. So it changed that quickly. Did you know at the time, because obviously the game was amateur, did you know at the time that if it did, because there were rumblings, weren't they, that it might be, did you ever think that was on your radar or do you, it's just like a dream? No, it was a, it was not on my radar, even from where I'm from. So I grew up in South Africa and from Wales, you know, I was going to go to Cambridge University, which was a big deal. Yeah. So they, that was the biggest thing that was going to happen, you know, going to university and to Cambridge University to play rugby, of yeah. course. But um, yeah. no, it was a real shock. It, it literally changed in weeks. So was it scouts coming along and watched you play and then they, they approached you after the game or how did it work? Back then? Um, I was playing for Welsh, the Wales teams, the national yeah. teams at the time, age grade teams and Wales students. Yeah. Um, and I it just, yeah, it was like... You, you're okay. Do you, do you want to now play professional sport? Which yeah. was really strange because I actually went to London to Saracens, which was uh, a low club now, but probably the best now yeah. at the time. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was it was that quick, um, and we were basically students with the money at the time. So wow. it was a, a real a real change for us. But um, but time, you know, to carry on your journey and do that. It's fantastic. And so, did you did you stop studying and stuff, and you've just like you had to go full of into rugby, or, or did you keep that as like in your back pocket? To keep yeah, it I, I actually actually because I was a trained teacher tra on my day off. Um, I I went to school and taught in Lycée Français, so and two other schools in London, yeah, just in yeah. case because we didn't know where it was going to end up. You know, whether you, you get injured and you lose your job. So at least I had some behind me and mm. sort of that work ethic but also not only that that sort of probably led me to my new lifestyle of just helping people you know I'm in a privileged position I didn't un really understand it at the time and the first year or so um, you, you it looks like slim people think getting paid money made money professional yeah but it's after you it's actually your behaviors mm. and the way you can influence other people so I'm gonna go on that go on yeah and obviously, obviously in that journey then you got more and more successful and played for some successful Wales teams uh, Welsh teams and you know from your perspective what was the biggest transition from it being an amateur game or the amateur experience into professional you said you get paid that's one thing but was it that everyone was a lot more focused was it you know a lot more um competitive maybe what, what, what did it feel like at the time because it was a big change i remember it yeah it, it was a behavioral change yeah huge you know how you had to look after yourself you had um diff a multi-discipline team of people around you now so it wasn't just a coach you had your conditioners your medical team everybody that were nutrition experts. nutrition yeah it was also a worldwide game now yeah which changed everything you know we we were um we own two-year contracts, I still do, which is, mind you, you can imagine the pressure bar on you all So what that year time. was that, Darren? What, what year? Uh, 96, I think it was. 96, okay. Yeah, so I, then I played for 14 years, 300-odd games later. But that was quite, um, it was a bit of an eye-opener because um, the worldwide game, and you had agents, you had external pressure, yeah. media, yeah. All, all of these things and then, things and then obviously World Cup sort of was it was they that would have been the second one was it coming up or just been yeah no I was yeah I was part of the 99 World Cup so it would have just been yeah. in the early stages that's right yeah because I mean now it's huge obviously yeah. but um 
yeah that was that was new as well wasn't it because we didn't have a world cup in rugby and then as you said it became a worldwide game and it was north and south yeah and 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 it was a lot of change in a very short period of time massive change and not for the good in some ways because mm. lots of clubs went under which happened again last year the three teams in england have gone under because um the people running the game weren't professional people off the pitch yeah of yeah course. so there was a, a huge cultural change from that side of things you know nobody knew how to pay you or look after you yeah. so we had to find our own way so that was probably the biggest change for me is looking having to look after myself to perform you know and so obviously we've gone from this thing of amateur game maybe things that you could get away with in the sport and now you're into this thing where you've got this team around you and stuff but and i guess there was a lot of teaching around mindset and stuff like that at the time that that would have been quite new for a lot of amateur players because they wouldn't have been exposed to it couldn't afford it maybe at the time no that that was um like you if you'd have asked a 21 year old me i'd have yeah. gone how do you do i go i don't know i just play 28 year old me i use my brain and my pictures that i've seen in the past when i was 35 finishing his brain i need people i need everything around me to be it's important and that was the the last sort of change in my career i'd done um, a master's in psychology because i didn't want to be a, a player who was a good player and now i was a coach i needed the mindset mm -hmm. let's let's really delve deeper into mindset and behaviors and how do you shape your culture on the back of that and it, you know the successful teams that you played with what do you think the difference was was it just was it really behavior what was the edge that gave you you know the competitive edge over the edge over teams that you played against do you think do you know it, it was actually our, our, our culture and the way we challenged each other my team which um we won a trophy very very successful um out of that team of 34 people there is 10 international coaches eight or nine um headmasters people who dealt with people yeah. actually that's what and we were challenging each so other you're all leaders in essentially in your own right in your own field yeah we didn't yeah. we weren't on receive yeah. we actually would challenge each other but respectfully and you know that was the kind of key when i look back i've done this sort of, sort of uh, a couple of years a couple back when i was just thinking of think this process and now uh, yeah, we actually were all leaders in our own way, but we were also good people. Did you, I mean, it's a, it's a, lot, it's a lot about legacy, you know, the book Legacy, with, yeah. about the uh, New Zealand rugby team. Was there, did you, I mean, that's obviously come out as a book, it's quite a large business book and a lot of people talk about yeah. it or whatever. Did you have your own sort of like code of ethics behind the scenes that kind of brought you closer together? Yeah, we did actually. The, 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 it actually, when I fast forward into my coaching career, we would, um, we would clean the changing room. We would pick our tape and our bottles up outside on the floor. So the groundsman didn't have to spend an extra half an hour doing that, or the cleaners had an easier job. Uh, yeah. All of these little bits, which we don't really, I, I don't think we thought about at the time, but definitely when I fast forward into my coaching career, they were the most important things. Yeah, it was good. And it's interesting because, I, you know, even the soccer world club or the football world football club, there's a couple of the teams that like the I think it was the Japanese team they would clean the changing room up to you know and then they got the fans cleaning the stands after the game but then we know through rugby this was going on you know like that culture that ethics and whatever and I guess the Japanese culture enforced that a lot more than let's say you could even argue the English culture or, or in terms of professional football where almost there's a sense of entitlement we're the superstars we leave here and that's why I love the difference between rugby and football there's that realism and there's that feet on the ground I think that's the best it, way to yeah it, it. it was and um sort of looking back and going through everything I've gone through now is like what I can do for you not what you can do for me that entitlement yeah and, and it was really tough you know, you've got agents wanting to sell you all the time and we've got to perform yeah but it was actually the base level being a real good human being and doing things for other people meant they help you so obviously we know we know we're going to go on coaching side of things mm. but what was the highest high you had as a player would you say oh playing for my country putting you know, that shirt you, on shirt you, on for the first wearing that red shirt you know standing in prince Paldi stadium 
actually the biggest high actually I know I'm going to go into coaching is um, my sons were squeezing me in the stadium when I was watching a, a World Cup game a couple of years back and they go dad I can't believe you played here and they were just squeezing me and I'm like are you guys all right yeah and went, dad I can't believe you've been here and that's the thing about when you're a player and you're young you blast through life yes you're blasting through and then all of a sudden that reflection and and only now um uh, March this year um my they, my son's done it for me for my birthday put my shirts my caps in a frame so it's been 20 years in the attic I think and that and I think at times as you as you're more like mindset driven driven and and as you put it like you're a coach and you're building stuff and a bit entrepreneurial in the way mm. that you approach life like you rarely live in the present and that's something I've had to learn as I as I got older is to appreciate those moments a little bit more than on to the next thing on to the next thing and it's very easy in sport because you're as good as your last game and so it's always the result the result the result and before you know it years have gone by well yeah um yeah it's not great when your mother-in-law says you're actually a nice guy <laughs> so she was watching me on tv so i had to put on a persona when i was a player yeah so i'd have to change because it's a physical contact sport and then she didn't like me on TV, but when I met her, she said, oh, you're actually a real nice guy, <laughs> which is great. But then when I flipped onto the other side of things, then that, that was a real tally moment, a moment because you go from being um, uh, selfish and blast through your last because yeah. you have to look after yourself and get from contracts and be physical to actually then becoming a people person and a giver. So that was the, the, the shift. I had, I had to shift that whole process. So the highest high was representing your country um what about honors did you did you win many win or, or yeah I, you, which is which is this is a, a good point actually because um i came i had to come back to wales to play for wales because they wouldn't pick you otherwise so i won trophy uh with newport and then i went to london and we won the premiership a year yeah. later so back to back so I, i'm not sure if i am or not i couldn't tell you but um i may be the only player who's won a uh, uh, Welsh and Welsh English oh, title. Okay. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah, probably not. But um, that happened, and I was 26. Yeah, never won a trophy since. So that's how hard it is to win. Yeah, uh, it's 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 one of those things, isn't it? I think you you when you win. And it's like it goes so quickly and then it's like the next season's in and now you're yesterday's news and you're competing but i guess from what you said your immediate reaction when i said what was the highest title said represent my country so it wasn't about the trophies and i think for me when you won the trophies did it feel everything you expected it or or, or not no I, I honestly my first trophy i can't remember and then a year later, he was, um, he was a player I was in the Welsh squad with. Um, so we were walking out in Twickenham and you, you kind of put your head down. You don't want to fail, really. And he goes, you need to savour all of this. Mm. And I actually then looked around the stadium, took photos. My teammates savoured it all. My parents had them all there with me. Yeah. And I can remember that. I can't remember the game still. That goes by in a blur, but I remember seeing my mum and dad when I'm walking up to pick up the trophy in the royal box, and they are there. My, just seeing how proud they are. Yeah. Can't remember. They can't remember. Which is bizarre. bizarre. They're never, they're never funny because they're never, they're never great games. Are game, you know? And it's, uh, we, we actually won the game, game by forty point difference. Wow! So we all actually, actually enjoyed it. Yeah. Which was a big win at the time because it was against a really good team who just won the European trophy the year before. So it was a tough, tough match. And we won it by 40 points because we were those people. Yeah. So that, that says about the characters in the team. Um, the year before I joined, only six of us joined. Um, they were in relegation. Yeah. A year late, late, season later, we win in the trophy by 40 points. So, yeah. It's a funny one because, you know, as amateur as I was, so I'm not professional by any means, but even when we won a couple of trophies, I didn't enjoy the games. No. I hated them. Um, I think I relaxed the last 10 minutes, you know, like, you know, thought, oh, oh, we got there. We got there. Mm. Um, and um, I think that was the first one we won, I think. And then the second one was, it was, I couldn't relax for the last two minutes. Because we got a player injured, took him off, and it was like the alley at the end. We managed to just get over the line. Um, but the same thing, I always remember at the half time saying to the guys, because I was managing, I, was managing, I said mm. to the guys, 
don't take this for granted and don't leave any with any regrets. Yeah. And irrespective of the game or whatever, everyone remember, even now messaging, they remember that thing of my family was watching, my dad was watching, my auntie was watching. It, it, it's that family thing that makes it all worth it. You know, and it, for me, it's savor those moments because they go like that. That's just... They, they, they do. And, uh, and that was the biggest thing out of my sort of professional coaching, playing life which I want to bring into the real world is those celebrations. You've got to yeah. find them. Yep. And and after every game, we would just sit together. You know, it looked like a, a war zone. <laughs> you know, the, the change room is pristine before you go next and there's blood and everything all over the place. But just sit and go, yeah. oh, you know, and it wasn't even, you know, like you wouldn't even have a beer, you have a water or whatever with it. With it there. Yeah. And just go, whew, that was good. What about what? Are, so that's like the highs and stuff. What about the lowest low? Because obviously there's lows in in the sport mm. as well, and it's not to move away from that. What, what did you have? What was the? What was the... Um, th- there's, you know, I, I know there's the yeah, um, adage is you're only good as your last games game, but um, yeah, it's really tough losing, yeah, particularly from a competitor. Yeah. So yeah, it's every week, and nobody understands. Actually, no, nobody would have understood how tough it was even, you know, when you, you're sitting at home, and you, you 12 operations later, you cut and your wife's taking your stitches out of your eye and everybody thinks, oh, this must be amazing being there. It's really tough. The, re- the lows for me was actually the coming back from injuries because it's yeah. you, really tough. The rehabilitation, the amount of work that goes into that, the, the feeling you've only got a two-year contract to go you've lost the game it was all of these things will go on but you've yeah, got to because if you get a serious injury with a two-year contract there's not a lot of time to get back and get good again to secure your place in a sense it's, it's massive yeah it, it's massive and not only that it's them um, now that i've pulled away from me so those levels of perspective are really important but when you're in that moment it just feels like it's all encompassing to you and and now that i've stepped away even my staff my medical team you, they're getting people at their lowest point in their life which is a, a drain on everything around you oh it's so, ma- massive yeah. i think for me it's like it's not talked about is it everyone wants to talk about the winning but they don't realize that for every winner there's a loser that for every victory there's an injury uh, and we kind of like and, and and you got fans right oh let's go find someone else let's go and sign somewhere else and it's like well that's a human there you you're dismissing you know and don't give them time they might be out of form no no get rid of them we need to get someone else in and yeah. people don't see it like oh well, they get paid enough that's often the excuse isn't yeah, it yeah you know like um which is it's fine this is what fans they pay their money is the 80 minutes on the weekend but it's actually the that's the easiest bit yeah that is the, that is the easiest bit of it all you well know? I, I was i was watching um so I, you know i'm a liverpool fan or whatever yeah. and they were talking to one of the players that had flown back from South America. Um, and he said, I was falling asleep in the player briefing for jet lag. Mm. You know, no one, no one thinks about that. Oh, he's just a bit slow. He's not on it today. Yeah, but they've, they've, they've flown back. They've got less than a day back and they're playing an early kickoff. We don't talk about that. Well, yeah. it, you know, that, that's the thing. So we play in South Africa. Um, so one day you're playing in Wales or England. You're flying to South Africa four days later. You've got, it's a 12 hour flight. It's now December where it's freezing over here. It's 35 degrees over there. Yeah. And you're playing at high altitude. Yes. Yeah, yeah, ouch is massive. It's where it? everybody just sees the game. Yes, sir. Oh, they've lost today. Uh, do you know how hard that is? To, yeah. You know, to just travel, play, altitude. We don't live like that over here. So, um, y- you know, you, you try and educate which is important and mm. some prop true fans get it a little yeah. bit but yeah it's not glamorous so so at what point because obviously you're going for a career you've had a six you've won a couple of trophies you've got longevity in a career and not a lot of people do you know you, mm-hmm. you avoided injury and so you managed to have a fairly decent career um at what point in your head were thinking i could do more though. i want to be a coach or i want to learn i could educate and that part of the game interests you yeah, it was probably in my last two seasons. Um, so I was starting, it was great. And I had a, 
guy who was behind me coming through and coming on and taking time. And I spent time actually coaching him. Mm -hmm. And um, he then played for England. And I messaged him afterwards. I said, oh, I can't believe you. He came off the bench, played for England. You, you, and, he, he, and within two seconds, he messaged me back, thank you. It's all down to you. So I was sitting back a bit, ooh. I was sitting on my sofa in the Do house. Do you think that felt, more, felt better than winning a trophy? Yeah. I, th I, th I think y y y when you watch people grow and change and get better, there's nothing. Because when you play, you're selfish. You have to look after yourself and you blast yeah. through life. But it's like having your children. It's something more than you. Yeah. And that was the biggest change for me. I'd done a master's in psychology, but I was going to change to become a coach, thinking, you know, let's focus on mindset. Well, I read lots of books. But then it was the human interaction yeah. that made the difference. So, so then obviously you, you're coming towards, towards the end of the second sector and that. And then what was it then? Was it a case of you going to find the opportunity or did people start approaching you? How did that, how do you transition from knowing that you're probably going to retire to I need an opportunity? Because again, it's a professional game and this is your career and when you stop you won't get paid so how, how did you make it, the transition there really really difficult actually um so i was in london um 10 month old baby i gave up what my last year of my contract and went to leeds okay which is polar opposite sides of the country because <laughs> yeah. um, i wanted to l l learn off a really good coach to lancaster coach to england so yep. i wanted to learn how to become a coach and play, which is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. In my life, the best thing I've ever done in my life. You got a ten-month-old baby at home, and you're trying to learn to be somebody different. Yeah, but in both in both forms, and yeah. also your 35-year-old body doesn't work like a work like a year-old body. <laughs> yeah. So it was really, really tough, really tough. And um, I was happy to finish at that time. I, I left my boots in the change room. Didn't even bother taking them home. Do you get to time. a point where your body's just, I'm done? Does your body just like say enough is enough? Y y yeah. Uh, kind of like when you get to 30, you're like, when is this going to end? And it just grows and, and grows. And um, particularly when you're you're a leader and then you can't, you can't with your physical, physical. Yeah. To, yeah. to adapt in. And that's where the adaptation changed for me as a coach. And then I used to lead with my brain and my voice and my language and my body language i was broken yeah but i would still go again my yeah. wife would be looking at me on friday night you can't play tomorrow and i'm going i'm playing tomorrow <laughs> it was really tough but that's when that transition came and thinking it's not about me physically doing what i need to do but i need to lead now and mm. that's the change that happened so you obviously psychology was quite a quite thing for you you know knowing and understanding and that and then were there were there any people that kind of inspired you that thought you know what I'm going to learn a lot of these people that aid you in your quest? Yeah, um, th I've worked with some amazing people, you know, from all over the world. So I've, I'm always learning um, from that side of things. But I also invested in myself. Um, I worked with the special forces because um, it actually didn't matter what I knew; it's actually what you know. So we, I put water go, water go for a year and they would li listen to my language and watch my body language because um, you have to have trust. Like hyper like comments is relationships and trust. Yeah. If you haven't got that, then and when I reflected back to my old teams that were successful, trusted each other. So talk me through the GoPro. So you're wearing a GoPro to look at the people that you're coaching's body language. Yes, and my language, to listen to my language too. Okay. So when I would talk, it's all recorded. Yeah. And we'd work, and I'd listen to it, and I'd watch myself every day. Learn, Is, was, that, was that intimidating, going from a rugby pitch, playing a game to people that life and death? I don't know, it can seem like life and death rugby on the pitch, but talking to the elite soldiers, if you like. Well, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm bringing my perspective of... Um, I, I, they need to know what people know around them so they can trust them. Yeah. And that's what that, and that was the big thing that came with this. My, my second question was probably more important than my first question. Cause then I needed to know what they could talk, tell me 
You know, it didn't matter. I was, from my playing position in, in the game, I was a technical, tactical expert, Yeah, which is brilliant. Now I had to think differently. I needed to know what you know, not yes. what I know. Yeah, that, so they're, the, they're the experts. You're just trying to... I'm just them. shaping where they need to go. Yeah, so so from you, you're obviously enjoying that whole experience of the SAS and whatever else, but then within the game itself, what opportunities came from Lee, from Lee beyond that? Um, so I, I was really fortunate. So I, so I, I, um, I went to Harlequins. I was academy head coach, which is really good really in terms of, um, of it's let me look at development people. Yeah. So I could do that. Then I moved to coach the first team. Then I went to Dragons in Wales as assistant coach. And, um, halfway through that season, my head coach got sacked. So I was now interim head coach. I'm 36 years old. Wow. Yeah, re yeah really, yeah. really, really young. Yeah. But I was a technical, tactical expert. So I could give the guys the game plans and they all believed in me. Next thing, I become head coach. Now I've got 200 people I'm looking at. The media, sort of strength and conditioning, commercial And again, players. people don't give them the time, are they? You know, like, like you see it, don't you? You say, oh, it's an interim role. But as a fan, you don't think about they've gone from responsible for this to it's all huge. about you it was huge and um, we actually were successful for half the season that's why i got the job and um i sat at the end of that season um with my wife and i said i'm gonna leave a legacy here and she was like no you need to win games <laughs> she's really good i was like oh, yeah. okay yeah. and then i went with my players at the end i said everything what do you think of the season now it's all gone what can we do you know i thought you were amazing but we miss you and I was like, oh, I need to win games and they miss me. Yeah. That's, that Finding was quite that a, that was a list. So I was thinking, actually, I, I actually need people. Yeah. I can't do this by myself. And that was the sort of game changer for me as I, I had to change my whole philosophy on the way I looked about things from being technical, tactical to needing people around me and giving people responsibility. And that's where that celebration comes in. I've got to having to see them every day and actually finding the good in people every day. That was the real challenge. It was the game is the game. So so go so we looked at the we looked at the sort of you as a player, but what about you as a you as a coach? What was the highest high there? Um oh, watching your your players achieve their goals. Yeah. Because you, you it's um the trophies okay, it's gone like that. Mm-hmm. But watching them play for their country, have long-term contracts, watching them with their families, celebrating with all each, with each other, there's nothing. Uh, and I think it probably comes from being in um, a physical contact sport because it takes a lot out of you. Yes. It's just sitting, going, oh, you were good today. You know what? I know what I find even just listening to you. Yeah the high thing is yes you mentioned when you're playing representing your country that was a high but seeing other players the high again that's in the legacy book isn't it book mm. even the shirt in the position better than someone mm. that you know leaving the shirt in a much better position in the way that you found it you know and and so it's like a baton being passed on yeah so it, again it was that privilege of representing and i think that's maybe something that's starting to be eroded i i think you know that mm. national it's <laughs> It's that national pride representing your country. It's like, you know, in football or even in rugby, it's like representing your football team playing for England was a pinnacle. It's not so much now. It's like, oh, I've got caught, got up, can't wait to can't wait over, I can get back to the club game. Um, but with the Welsh rugby team, having been there, I was there a couple of years ago watching um, South Africa, Wales, where the fan run on the pitch. Mm. Remember that game? I really remember. I was, I was all wrapped up then watching that game. But just being part of that experience, the sort of like the, the, the anthem and the noise and it, it, it yeah, it was, it was incredible. Well, well, I, well, I think, um, just thinking back to when I first started to, to now, um, performance was measured by winning trophies. Yeah. Winning the league. Yeah. And I think it's not quite like that anymore. No. I think performance is measured, and I'll give you an example. When I was at Bath, um, uh, four so two people can play in the in the team, 
at once. Four in the same position played for England that year. Wow. Three went to the World Cup in one position. So they had to help each other. We had to grow this group of people to challenge each other really well. So as a performance goal, we actually got to a cup final and we didn't win the trophy, but I'm looking at three people going to a World Cup. Indeed, yeah. That, that, that. I watched um, I watched Bath Bristol again just before the pandemic. That was a strange crowd because the Bath crowd were like, you're expecting a roar and it's all good show. You know, it's all a like ripple of applause. Man United uh, Liverpool you're talking about now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It was just very different atmosphere. And I think I think Bristol Bristol won actually. They won I think they won by a point. But it's it, my thing is there is does it seem for the players that that is the pinnacle representing the country more so than winning a winning a trophy? And is that because of the the world games such as it is now that that's why they want to get there? Um, I, I think in any sport, any part of, you know, you, your country is important to you. Yeah. And you're from there. You know, it's, it, I, yeah, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing like. But I see, I see, I see that drive more in rugby now, more than ever. But I don't see the same in, I don't see the same in, I don't see the same in football. Or soccer it, it's it's kind of quite a difficult thing. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think, to be fair to Gareth Southgate, you listen to the language of his England players, is the same. Yeah. They're aligned to where... He's created a culture. He's created a culture, yeah. and, and that's the big thing for me. That's where rugby kind of stumbled on this. We had the culture, but we yes, didn't understand did. it. Yeah, yeah. We didn't Agreed. understand it, and that's what sort of interested me when I was changing into coaching that all that reflection and also why we why did all of us just win a trophy and we didn't know where you can your language and body language change in the football world. I, but then I think I think the culture of in rugby goes through every level like for instance if I go grassroots which is where my mm -hmm. experience is but if I go grassroots I find football to be very elitist everyone wants to be the best player in the world blah 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 blah, blah. Well, rugby is, it's inclusive. Let's bring everybody in and everyone can be part of it and everyone can, you know, play a game. My son's part of the rugby team. He doesn't go every week, but they include him, you know, and he, mm. he's part of it. And I just like that atmosphere. It's like everyone's got to, everyone's got a part to play and a role to play. Football, it's all about being in the first 11. And if you're not, you're an idiot type thing. And, yeah. and that was the biggest shift for me when I obviously having played the game, having coached or whatever. And then my son said, oh, I want to play rugby instead of football. And then I was like, they got culture right here. It just it, literally, that was the standout thing. I remember saying to my wife, I said, I love the culture, but having not been in it, I never experienced it. And then when we watched, we started watching rugby games and, and the crowd's different, you know, it's just yeah. everything feels how do we put it? The violence is on the pitch, not necessarily in the terraces, you know? Yeah, well, I'm a, yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> I think, I think rug, rugby is a legalized assault. That's what I used to look at it. But, but you, you're right. But that's also a part of growing up and um, physically as you develop. Too, yeah. You know, you don't know how tall you're going to be a big yacht. No. So you, you start molded into different ways where football, I need you to be this and that and this, where you actually let him just grow. Same, same with the, the women's sport now, and particularly in rugby too. You know, just find your way. Yeah. And then it's okay. And the other thing, which is, like I say, I did say legalize assault. You shake hands afterwards. afterwards. Yeah. yeah that, that, you know, I did and it's start, a big hit, thing. It's a big it's thing. Big thing. Yeah. It's, it's a real big thing about that. Um, I don't know. I'm going to digress a little bit. So I, I have to take it. this it's off. Fine. You know, I have to take this off, actually. <laughs> um, I played a game. I, I was getting up off the floor. And the guy stamped on the back of my arm, put my elbow through my skin. Yeah, you definitely have to take this off. <laughs> you think. Um, I go right into hospital. He's getting wheeled in for an hour later. Lost. It has to go. Oh, wow. My players walked all over him. Oh, my gosh. 20 years on, I go into Bath. He's now in charge of player welfare. No way. And goes... I was wrong that day and shook my hand. Wow. So that, that, that's kind of... Takes real, people to get, but yeah. It, it's kind of like, I know what I've done for you. And I am, 
yeah, I deserved what I got. So, so saying that, you know, because there's a big thing in, in rugby now with the whole play welfare, yes. with the whole heads and stuff like that, is that, you know, that's a big thing in the sport. Do you think it's changed the game for the good or for the, or, or for the worse? Would you, would you um, I, I think um, anything about safety is for the good. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the only thing I question with that, I'm 100% behind safety and all of these things. You've got to look after people's well-being. Um, but we're professionals here. Yeah. Who are these really professionals here looking in? And, and you know, you've got to be really clear because we're giving the example. So as a you play on Saturday, what, if we lose a game or something goes wrong, we practice Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. Um, officials got to don't stop they don't practice they just turn up the game and talk about it on a saturday yeah so it's kind of you got to understand there's two bits to this professional again is a behavioral thing yeah and who's looking after the it all exactly. it's, a, it's understanding the game and i think the general consensus in a lot of sport is ex-sports people are ex-sports people and they're not being involved in the future decision making of a game mm. and having played it surely they have more insights into how things are than somebody that's maybe studied at a university and and or doing it as a part-time job so i'm a massive advocate of saying you've got to learn from the people that played it simple as that yeah, they wait. know they know the tricks you know i i i was taught by a few players tricks ex-pros and they go mm. well when you do this you do this i was like i was like I didn't know all this stuff existed, but because they're pros, they've got all these things well, that we yeah, didn't They know. play into win. They're competitors. That's yeah. one thing you've got to understand. Competitor. I always used to say this whenever I had, um, particularly my conditioning staff, and they prescribe a training program. I said, have you done it? Have you actually done th yeah. that program? Yeah, yeah. Because how can you tell somebody to do something that you don't? Yeah. You've got to feel it. Yeah. You know, because you can say you've done whatever and they fail in front of your eyes and you can't say because they're unfit. It's like, actually, that's really tough. Yeah, yeah. So it's that, do you, do you actually know how that feels? And I think it, 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 the, the strange thing is, because I think the biggest thing that's come out of modern day sport is, sport is the fee piece. Yes. You know, and I think if fee is one of the major values in sport, then you're going to have to get ex-players involved because they know what it's like. You know, and then you can say, look, when you're in this position and this happens, this is this is how you might react, or this mm -hmm. is because you're you're under pressure. I mean, I, I you know, again, you see the picture: a guy scores a goal, and he's he's probably lost his head a little bit because he doesn't know which end he's celebrating in. But then when you see the picture of the player, and then you see the crowd and the fingers and the this that, and the other, they're dealing with that. Do you know what I mean? It, 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 you know, that's a really good point. And, um, and there's actually something I had to change in myself. Is, um, again, you know, a 14-year career was great. Yeah. But it didn't matter what was going on in my world. Now what's going on in their world. Yeah. Yeah. And getting into that level is the most important thing. You know, what are they dealing with? Yeah. You know, all of those things you just mentioned and not dictating to them just working her out feeling it yeah and then dealing with what needs to go on and that and that was the biggest change like i say the game don't change a kick is a kick a pass is a pass yeah blah 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 whatever it is but the world around them is changing all the time all the time and that leads me on to my next thing because obviously you've coached in various different clubs of sizes and that and sort of stuff but you've ended up coaching the welsh ladies team and that was a complete culture shift as well. That that was the biggest thing, biggest challenge I've ever had in my life. You know, I lived in a man's world, which I was an expert. Yeah. Now I went and the the other thing with it was it was going into an environment that was under serious investigation and pressure mm -hmm. for all sorts of reasons. There was the sexuality side of things. There was the bullying side of things. So it was really, really tough go into their environment and also at that time I were just about to shift from being amateurs into professionals so I've gone from a world where I got my guys coming in and being pros yeah where you've got 
the women coming in in the evening, like the old amateur days that I used to. Yeah, that's it, because they're doing a day job. Day whatever, job as yeah. well. So, and they were, and I mean, people are traveling from Manchester to Cardiff to train in the night, you know, and it was, it was a real eye opener for me, but also gave me massive respect. Mm -hmm. for for lots of different reasons you know just learning say, say it'll flip me back to my people side of things the only way i could, could i could deal with that is if i was just didn't see men or women or wh whatever the background it was people yeah and that's getting back into the world what are you what are you dealing with dealing with today it didn't matter how i was the expert anymore it mm -hmm. was like how i shaped that environment and um best thing i ever done hardest thing i've ever done yeah, and I'm really proud to see them now, now as a professional group of group athletes. So, just saying the you know because obviously psychology is a background. You're coaching in, my you know mindset and stuff mm. like that. Have you got any sort of lessons that now what you've used in elite sports that could apply to business people and entrepreneurs? Is there any things that you can see some see think parallels where you could help you could somebody that essentially they're putting all on their line there because it's their family. Because mm -hmm. they're doing the business, um, they're up, they're downs. Because one month, the month loads of money, and the next month, not so much. Mm. Um, there's feedback. They feel they've done a great job, and someone else says, "No, that's not good enough for me." Is there any tips or hints that you can you can give I, the listeners? I think you've got to be really clear um, on your philosophy, and I'm talking from a coaching philosophy. But it says my life philosophy, whichever environment I go into. So my first bit was people first. Yeah. And what I mean by that is you walk into your organization and you've got a 19-year-old, a 25-year-old, 30-year-old. They're different they're people. Yeah. Got, and they've got different experiences in their life. So their behaviors become um, shaped in whatever form. And you've got the responsibility to shape that. So you can't just go in and put a blanket approach on things. It just that's not gonna there's happen. nuances behind the different generations that's it and you've yeah. got to be respectful for those side of things so you've got to look at them as people yeah also from your own personal point of view um my emotional control is really really important because mm. my language and body language will really affect you in lots of different ways yeah you know i, I call them accidental mind coaches it's like i can change your mindset quickly with my language and my body language Mm. So if you're going to perform or you need to get some sort of output out of people, you've got to be really measured in what you do. So I think you need to be really deliberate. So there's a case of always being on, isn't there, as the, as the coach? You don't, yeah, you don't yeah. really... So how do you switch off at that take, level? Take my hat off. Take your hat off? I put my hat on to be deliberate and controlled. So you're in it. And I'm then... in it. This is, my, this is my job. This is what I need to do. And it's about you. But the minute you take your hat off, I'm dad again. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and then I go. I, the second bit to it is, um, I go player first or employee first. As if you want to talk to it in that way, is like you. Um, it doesn't matter what I know. What do you know? Yeah. Can I help you? Yeah. Even to my staff, have we tried? Because it is a classic thing that people have told them what to do. They're just not doing it. Yeah. And I go, okay. Have you helped? them yeah shape their behavior have you helped change the person um and if they go yes that's fine but then we have to change we have to change them. so that it does come to that point if you get what i mean yeah, you know, yeah, I, yeah. Try, I try my best to change you and even the last bit um we say about team first we we have it's great to have creative conflict mm. and that's part of it and then okay that's cool and this is the good thing about sport you know the shake hands okay let's put our team first now we cool when you decide and you commit, done. Do you, I mean, obviously, because you've been involved in many, many teams now. Do, um, one of the things I was taught about team building, and it's great to see if it works at elite sport level, is the forming, storming, norming, and performing. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that? Yeah. Is that, does that happen? Do you see, do you see that work its way out? Yeah, it does. I, I, yeah, I know the, the principle behind it. Yeah. But, um, the, the actual gem, I think, is being really deliberate in how do you have a performance conversation. Let's talk about that. Let's learn how to do it. 
It's providing that safe environment, to be honest, isn't it? It is. And also yeah. the, that the, that my language and body language can change you massively. So if I said to you, um, uh, Dara, let's have a performance conversation. But I've told you what a performance conversation is. Yeah, we've yeah. learned about it. Yeah. I do feel a lot more comfortable talking to me around and going, I need to speak to you. Yeah, because you've already got you're already you're on going, the defensive. Yeah, all your you, you just you just actually you you create those environments. I, I I use stuff like I say with your body language, language, you know, victim victors. I can tell you're a victim easy. Yeah, your language and body language will change. So, but that's a better way of telling you. You know, you you look pretty poor today. Do you do you? I mean, I guess one of the hardest things to manage is when you see a play as you talked about when you're getting older. Do you? have that relationship with coaches or players where you can go you you can have that honest conversation that you can see they're on the down and 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 get them to see it or do you just pretend until you don't pick them no that that, that is the, the that is the most important yeah bit of it that's again i'll go back i just use a little real simple equation you know your relationships are so important that's why people yeah then your trust is really important that I'm honest in what I do. Yeah. And then yeah. you, you've got to have that way of being real. I said that emotional control. Yeah. You know, I, I can, they, they got to see the person, which is me. And I'm not afraid then to actually go, look, sorry, but I, I got that wrong. Or oh, that was terrible. Or it's not one way. Yeah. So yeah, the, 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 and that, that could foster that relationship. That if you say, yeah, I can got it wrong. It's on my back. Mm. But also, hey, you got to take responsibility as well as an individual. Yeah. Or whatever. And, and being like, um, uh, I'd be a good human, I think. Yeah, yeah. I'd be a good human. I think that's probably my my foundation. Like I say, that's my little people for just be a good human. So when you leave, I, I, wherever I've left my places, I don't care if people say I was good technically, tactically. I, but if they say I oh, was a good guy, I'd be happy. It was, um, I remember watching the film Moneyball. Have you seen? Yeah, I've seen about Moneyball, that. yeah. And it, Billy Breen, the, the general manager, and he would, he would, he'd be, he would stab him in the front. So he'd walk up to them and say, we're going to trade you mm. because of this. But they respected him for doing it. It's almost like they gave him permission that if the time did come that they could do that. Yeah. And I think I find that sometimes within the coach in the sporting arena where sentimentality creeps in the reality is you're still in the results game right yeah you've got to get results because because at the end of the day if the coach doesn't get results get he's gonna go you know that's a really um really really good point because um if you're thinking about the end result this yeah. is why i like culture so much and how your culture has actually defines you um because I had one of four jobs in a country. country. So I imagine how many people many worldwide want your job. Yeah, yeah. And it's a results business. Of yeah, course, I yeah. get that. It's like, yeah, making, it's like yeah. making money. If you don't make money, you lose your business. Lose your business. Yeah. So yeah. there is that. But that's why I love the cultural side of things so much. Is like, I believe culture is your first competitor. Yeah. Because it's how your people will respond to the challenges that are coming your way. And even from the difficult challenges. Because, you know... You, 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 as I said earlier, you're working on two-year cycles of contracts. Mm. So it's really tough, that. The conversation is it, it's tough. My, yeah, because it's, 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 it's an interesting one because what I've seen is the, the you know, a game within soccer with first time people being signed for seven-year contracts. Mm. That's just bizarre, you know. But they want to sign you seven years to sell you. Keep your worth, keep the price up, but you still got to perform to keep to, keep to that level. Mm. So... You've got all this, you've got the playing in the trenches, trenches, drawing, 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 drawing. you've got the coaching aspect of things, but, but you're looking transition into other things now. Do you want to just share a little bit about what you, what you're looking to do and how you can help other people for people? Yeah, I, I think from, you know, working in high performance, obviously your output is massive, but it's your, the way you, you go about your work is really, really important. Mm -hmm. And the way you look after your people. Yeah. So, you know, there's a real simple um, definition of culture. People talk about culture all the time. And a real simple definition of culture for me from a New Zealand anthropologist is um, a people's response to challenge. Mm. So how much do you invest in, invest in your people to the challenges? 
and I, and I don't mean to this all these things like con performance concentration body language all of these things are so so important mm -hmm. and that's the sort of gift I've taken from the sports world in that you you've got to live it you can't talk about it you've got yeah. to live it every day and well you you, you win, in its crisis sense it's winning or losing yeah and particularly in rugby drawing is a lot more rare than it is in other sports yeah so how you respond under that pressure how you respond is the real measure of somebody it was how you live your culture yeah you know everybody talks about culture it's a buzzword but you gotta live it every day you can't be on this emotional roller coaster all the time because you you've got to get your performances up and that, that's the one gift i've had from air when you which has been really powerful mm. um probably the way you look at things you have to have different levels of perspective yeah you know what are you looking at are you looking at a mindset issue a structure issue or a skill set issue mm -hmm. and just being able to jump up and down those things is another gift do you think generally at that level it's mindset more than anything um you can find mindset or skills that let you down because your structure should be pretty good yeah because that's it's like yeah, yeah and even in a business sense if your yeah. structures are pretty good you it's either going to be a mindset issue or a skill set skill set issue. yeah while your performance isn't you're not getting but what you not getting what you want so that's the, the the one element of it the other thing that i'm really quite passionate about and what i want to take out is um you know when you're a head coach of a team of 100 200 plus people of multi-discipline teams um ages behaviors people are broken all these things are going on around you um leadership's a lonely place so who who, who helps you generally I wish I had help. Okay. I would have had, my, my wife would have helped me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, your family is another important side of it, but um, I had to invest in myself. Yeah. And the, I got a guy um, who's my mind coach. He, he gave me a good analogy, actually, which when I first met him. Um, when you're hungry, what do you do? Eat. When you're tired, what do you do? Sleep. Yeah. How do you rest your brain? Yeah. I was like, mm -mm. No, it's really good. Yeah, and I had to talk to him. He's not from my world, and I had to go into that side of things. And and that's the other bit for leaders, leadership teams, the importance of being a leader, and what you actually can get out your people. No, it's it's a, it's a true. It's lonely at the top, mm. you know. And I think what I've done over the years, I've spent a lot of time in networks full of people that are of a similar level or maybe higher but they kind of understand that when the lights are off and everyone's gone home and they're doing whatever else you're thinking about day two day three day four day five you need to be able to talk it through you know and often you know like Dougal um we had him on the podcast today I was in a part of a peer-to-peer -peer group and you know his journey was that he took over essentially company was sold by his parents so he became the new ceo effectively and but he had people around him that said don't worry we'll help you through this you know which is great because without that because he in that instance you didn't always have your parents either because it was quite a tough time anyway because the family the fans grew and there was tension the business got sold and then he came in as the the ceo and having been in the business but it was like once they had sold and got out, they were like, "We're done. We don't need to yeah. talk about this anymore." Yeah. So he needed other people around. Well, him. well that was uh, like I say when I got my first head coaching job, I needed people. Yeah, I needed people all around me all the time, doing the right things, um, because thing again with the leadership, you can't have one leader fall over and then the company goes no. bust. You know, you just keep it should maintain a level yeah of course you miss your somebody who leaves that's yeah. the thing about it being in a um, high performance world and you know people get sold and agent moves you but we can't fall over yeah the club doesn't finish because you can't finish because you've lost your best player or you yeah. lost your best physio or or whatever because you've got to understand as i say about people and they are journeys as well they may want a new challenge so your yeah. culture around it all is really important and yeah, the yeah. way you lead which is a lonely place yeah but you need other people to help you lead you know and that's kind of where i've come to now this stage in life when i don't want a job in business i don't want to be a businessman but yeah. i want to help business people succeed and, and flourish flourish and be and just people help people 
Well, I think the, I think the key point there is you want to help those types of people not feel lonely. That they've got someone in their corner batting for them yeah. and helping them through the challenges that they face. It seems to me, and you know, you you can only answer this, so I'm going to ask it anyway. What do you prefer, playing or coaching? I think I know what the answer is. Well, you can never take the little boy out of the man, can you? So no. I like that. I, I have a, I'm a competitor, but there is nothing like watching people do well. Yeah, it just feels good. So it's like, see, you, you, you. You, it's like coming. We um, it was a real interesting one actually. So it was at London Irish, and um, twelve of us, our partners were pregnant in what? one season. Wow. We were really su successful. We were I was about twenty six, something like that. And the first guy came in, and we go, "What was it like?" You know, they they just had their baby, and you go, "I can't explain." And then the next one came in, and then when his mic, and I was like, "I just can't explain what it's like to have something." Yeah, that's better than you. It's the shift. It's, it's, it's a the, shift. Yeah, yeah it's something. That's the only way I can explain it. There's a, there's something changes, and I think that's the real great mark of a leader where they be they just give up themselves. To whatever that, they need to, they need to. And I think that 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 for me, <coughs> I think in life, I think that's the, the goal of life, is that you enjoy that fatherhood mm. <coughs> that the son is part of the journey but ultimately it's to be the mentor the men you know yeah. and help and educate and inspire the next generation and that seems to how life how life structured up and interestingly enough our playing life is short I, but your mentoring life could be that's, that's 30 a, 40 years that's a really good way of putting it and also you're playing life you're selfish you're looking after yeah. me where i yeah. think or my nature hopefully most human nature is to look after other people yeah and that, and, that, and that's the big shift and that's what that's why i said i kind of i could see what your answer would be is that you've enjoyed the playing side of thing but what excites you is the impact the impact that you can offer people and and help them on their journey not feel so lonely but using the elite skills skills that have helped teams win trophies and get these finals and stuff to help them to succeed in what their chosen vision and mission yeah, is. Yeah, and it's also, I, I think, reflecting back on me, you know, getting older as well. Um, I was in a bubble of sport I yeah. was, and I had to keep myself locked up in that bubble. Now I, I'm actually really excited about coming out of that bubble and... Seeing what the world's like. Yeah, and helping yeah. wherever I can go. So, um, and I will go back to my individual self. It's a hell of a challenge that I fancy. Yeah, and that's it. So how would they get in how, how would people get in touch with you, Darren? Are you on LinkedIn and things like that? Or is that part? Um No. No. Oh yeah. I, I'm yeah. in my bubble. You're so you've got to think about this. Like yeah. you say, I'm in a sporting bubble where you get lots of uh, people's opinions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I've actually um I'm not on social media for I was deliberate about yeah, this because I've got yeah. a family as well to protect. Um, I will do. I've got an email address and a telephone number. Yeah, yeah. I've got five, so I need to upgrade a little bit. But, um, I, I can be your agent. So if you need to get a hold of Darren, come, come through me and you. I'll connect you with him. Definitely. <laughs> now, I will get up to, into all of that sort of stuff soon. And um, uh, yeah, like I say, it's a new world for me, but an exciting world. So I'm looking forward to it. No, well, thank you so much for spending time just on the sofa, just sharing your journey and, and you know, your quest uh, your future and that you know we would love to be part of it and continue to get you on the sofa as, as the, the as the the journey goes but really thank you for spending the time and sharing you know openly and honestly most of the journey so far so really appreciate it thank no, you thank no, you. actually um yeah, really nice to share what i've got yeah. so if you know if i can help anybody out there that would, that would be brilliant to the i'm sure you can the best thing 100 percent Thank you so much. Cheers. Cool. Thank you. Everybody, thank you for listening to the Purpose People podcast. You can obviously see us on YouTube where you can see our wonderful setting here that we film every time we do a podcast. But you can also listen to us just in your ears on Apple, Amazon, Spotify and Google. Please like and subscribe to YouTube and please leave a review on our podcast. It really helps us get the message out that can help people live a life on purpose for purpose. We want to help you make purpose a priority.